Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Fairness sits at the centre of our democracy. People should be able to go to the polling booth with the knowledge that their vote will go where they want it to go, that it aligns with their beliefs, and if their first choice isn't successful, that their vote won't be distributed via a dodgy backroom deal. Right now, the system that determines who comes to this place is broken due to a combination of group ticket voting, where parties, not the voter, get to direct preferences, and preference harvesting, where parties of wildly differing ideologies team up in the hope that their number comes up in a lottery, where you have alliances between the Stop Coal Seam Gas Party and the No Carbon Tax Climate Skeptics Party, between Family First and Drug Law Reform, where one random lucky party gets to be the winner and one random lucky party can have a random big impact on the future of our country. The Greens' vision for our representative democracy is that people's votes are reflected in the results. I want to start tonight by addressing two critical things. The first is the myth that these changes will mean independents and minor parties will be wiped out. And the second is to note that these changes actually aren't going to get rid of preference arrangements. Preference arrangements will continue to be made, but it's going to be up to the voters to decide whether to follow a how to vote card that recommends a preference flow. And to the people that are musing that about the diversity that comes when people are elected with only a handful of votes and that's saying that that's a healthy thing, I reckon it's true that diversity is healthy oh, sorry, in our democracy. Senator Ludwig. Um, but this sorry, diversity. Uh, Senator Rice, can you resume your seat, please? Call the, uh, the acting deputy president uh, to the attention of the state of the chamber. Yes, thank you. I think a quorum is required. Yeah. So ring the bells. Quorum present, Senator Rice. 
Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I say that it's true that diversity is healthy in a democracy, but this diversity should reflect the wonderful diversity that we see in our society, not a lottery that's already been rigged. The truth is that independents and minor parties won't be wiped out. They just won't get elected unless people vote for them, and that is how it should be. And the beauty of preferential voting is that if your first choice doesn't get elected, then your second or your third or even your fourth choice can. But when parties direct the preferences, that doesn't happen. It means that the results are not reflecting the wishes of the Australian people. Instead, the results are being determined by secret deals done behind closed doors. We all know the circumstances of Senator Muir's election. The motoring enthusiast party receiving the first preferences of just half of 1 per cent of people. To his credit, Senator Muir has approached his time here in a considered manner. But what can you say to the people who voted for the Animal Justice, Stop CSG or Bullet Train for Australia parties when their votes ended up with a party that supports hunting and shooting, logging of our native forests and roads ahead of rail? Look, if people are really serious about injecting an element of citizen juries into our parliament, well, we would need a referendum to achieve that, and somehow I just can't see it getting up. The last federal election was the eruption of this broken system, but the problem has been building for some time. This lottery means that for every Senator Muir, there's a senator like Family First's Steve Fielding, who was elected with less than 2 per cent of the vote. Now, I'm sure the people who voted for Labor in 2004 were appalled when they found that their vote had elected Stephen Fielding. To the people who try to argue that the Greens have benefited from group voting tickets and are now pulling up the drawbridge behind us, I want to share the history of the Greens in Victoria over the last 20, 24 years to illustrate the absurdity of these assertions. It is absolute codswallop. We haven't been a flash in the pan. We've done no preference deals that have betrayed our values. And we've had a strong focus on party processes so that we are strong and resilient and united. The Greens candidate who was up against Stephen Fielding in that 2004 election, David Ristrom, he polled almost five times Fielding's primary vote but he didn't, but didn't benefit from preference deals and so ultimately wasn't successful. And David Ristrom would have been an absolutely terrific senator. Going back to the start of our party, I was one of the founders of the Greens in Victoria in 1992. Yes, I'm actually one of those Greens of old that Senator Ludwig was misrepresenting in his rhetoric just before. The Greens began in 1992 because Labor had failed Australians who care about the environment, about social justice, peace and nonviolence, and participatory democracy. I personally was passionate and motivated to be throwing myself into the Greens because I was fed up with being sold out by the Labor Party. We stood one candidate at the 1993 election, Rebecca Wigney in the seat of La Trobe, and got 4.5 per cent. Not a bad result for a first outing. We had decided not to stand in the Senate that year. We supported Janet Powell's campaign as an independent, with her having left the Democrats. In 1996, Peter Singer was our Senate candidate. We stood on a strong environment platform, including taking serious action on climate change, a platform that was missing from Labor and the Coalition's platforms, and we achieved 2.9 per cent of the vote. Bit of an increase, but yes, not enough to get elected. In 1998, young Indigenous woman Charmaine Clark was our Senate candidate, but our vote slipped back to 2.5 per cent. So she didn't get to be the first female Indigenous senator. We had to wait another 15 years for Senator Perris to be elected to achieve that. 2001 was the Tampa election. People were appalled that Labor had sided with the coalition and supported horrific asylum seeker policies. And that picture of refugees baking on the decks of the MV Tampa is seared in my memory. And the shock and despair 
when the then Labor opposition leader, Kim Beazley, supported the hateful prejudice, the anti-refugee position of Prime Minister John Howard. So our, many other people felt the same way. Our vote soared to 6 per cent with candidate Scott Kinnear, and people voted for us as a party that would speak out for the rights and well-being of refugees. But yet again, Scott missed out because we didn't sell our preferences like the other parties. And it's been with great sadness that we've seen the Labor Party in a race to the bottom on refugee policy ever since. So fast forward to 2007. Now Senator Richard Di Natale missed out on being elected despite receiving 10 per cent of the vote. But in 2010, after almost two decades of growing our support in the community, building our vote, doing the street stalls, the door knocking, the town hall meetings, Richard was finally elected with a quota in his own right. It was a long time coming. And I'm proud that we have grown the party we have here and in state and territory parliaments across Australia without resorting to gaming the system. Instead, we've had the courage to take action on our strong values, leading the way on global warming, on fair treatment for people seeking asylum, on supporting those in the community who need it most, and for at least on the, in the last 12 years on these very reforms that will strengthen our democracy. Our vote has grown, and as our vote has grown, people have, we have been elected. This is just a micro-study of the Greens' rise, but it's clear that under the current system, people's votes are not being reflected in the results. And the changes we're debating today will put control over preferences back in the hands of the voter. And so if someone wants to vote one animal justice, two motoring enthusiasts, then that's their choice. Voting one to six above the line or beyond six if the voter wants will allow this to occur. And these changes will mean that if the Animal Justice Party, the No Coal Seam Gas Party, the Bullet Train Party, the Hemp Party, the Sex Party, the Drug Reform Party all poll a couple of percent each and hand out how to vote cards that recommend preferences and if voters agree with their recommendations and enough people vote for them, then one of these parties has got a really good chance of being elected. But the decision to vote for them lies with the voter. And if the preference you know, arrangement somehow you know, slips somebody else, the fundamentalist Christians, into the preference mix, well, then the voters will notice and they will not vote that way. They will have the choice. Of course, if we want a system that is truly diverse, then we should start talking about proportional representation in the House of Represent Representatives. That's also Greens' policy, but let's get these Senate voting changes through first before we embark on that campaign. For now, these changes will ensure that our parliament is more democratic. But instead of identifying the problems with the system and working together to fix them, we've been left with a scare campaign from Labor and the crossbench. Although I don't agree with the crossbench position, I can kind of understand how they, why they hold it. Many of them have benefited from this broken system and are fighting to keep their spot here. But the hypocrisy from the Australian Labor Party is appalling. We've now endured weeks of Labor senators, particularly the senators who have benefited most from the current system, busting their guts in the chamber, suggesting we're going to benefit from the changes in the same breath as they say that we've been done over and will lose seats because of them. They don't know whether they are Arthur or Martha. Let me be clear. There is one reason and one reason alone that we are supporting these changes, because it will make our democracy stronger. If we gain seats, it will be because our vote grows. If we lose seats, it will be because our vote has fallen. And the same will go for Labor, for the Liberals, for the Nationals, the same for Independents. This Senate reform legislation that we are debating today is an opportunity for the Greens, for us, for this Parliament, this Senate, to implement our vision. And we've got the courage to follow it through. We've been pushing for these changes since 2004. And these reforms were even written into our minority government agreement with Labor. 
Labor agreed in the written agreement between our two parties after the 2010 election that the parties note that Senator Bob Brown will reintroduce as a private member's bill the Commonwealth Electoral Above the Line Voting Amendment Bill 2008. The ALP will consider the bill and work with the Greens to reach reforms satisfactory to the parties. Of course, ALP actually did nothing about this in the period of government between 2010 and 2013. But after 2013, we finally thought that we had these reforms satisfactory to the, party, to the parties when Labor supported the recommendations unanimously that came from the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. The JSM interim report on the inquiry into the conduct of the 2013 federal election Senate voting practice, practices April 2014. And this report recommended optional preferential above the line voting and partial optional preferential voting below the line, with a minimum sequential number of preferences to be completed equal to the number of vacancies. After a year long process, hearings all around the country, an incredibly long and thorough process, it reached this unanimous conclusion. It was not rushed through. It has not been done without adequate consideration. Processes like the JSCAM inquiry are an absolute joy to my heart, and I believe that the majority of Australian people would think likewise, because my way of doing politics is to seek to collaborate to try and understand where people are coming from, to seek to understand their ideas, not just to reject them on the basis that they are coming from the opposing side, to acknowledge good ideas regardless of where they come from, to see through the politics and to, follow, to focus on the policies, to see whether we can reach agreement. And it's not just me that thinks like that. I know that Australian people in general are like that, that one of their biggest gripes about politicians and why they don't trust us is they reckon that we just oppose for opposition's sake. So the change of heart from Labor last month, not based on logic or understanding or any change of information, was a profound shock. And the only way they can justify, justify their about face is to argue that black is white, to mislead, to lie, to try to scare people who are confused about what's going on. But of course, we all know what really is going on. We know that power brokers, backroom operators in Labor, realised that they were going to be losing some of their power, that they would, were no longer going to be able to direct the votes of millions of voters through backroom deals, that that power instead would be transferred into the hands of voters. And the other scare campaign that we've seen from Labor is that this will deliver a majority for the coalition in both houses. I know this because people have told me they're worried about it. And to those people, let me assure you that it is nothing more than a pathetic scare campaign. Even the ABC's election analyst, Anthony Green, has said it doesn't stand up to analysis. This voting reform is not going to restore the ABCC. It's not going to abolish the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. We have been the Clean Energy Finance Corporation's greatest champion and would not do anything to put it at risk. And then we see the games played by Labor today. They have tried to divert attention from their own missed opportunities by using people's love as a political tactic. And this offends me. Yes, our party platforms support marriage equality, but it was the Labor Party that sided with John Howard in 2004 to define marriage as being between a man and a woman, and it is Labor that continues not to bind their vote. You'd think against Labor values until some distant time in the future. And then the Labor Party has got the guile to lie about it on social media, claiming that we voted against our own bill. Complete baloney. The Labor Party knew full well that that wasn't the case. But they underestimated the public. I don't often take notice of social media, but it was with some satisfaction that I saw the number one comment on the ALP's Facebook post from Tim Lilly say, why do you persist in treating Australian people as morons, ALP? The Greens didn't vote against their own bill for marriage equality in the Senate, only against debating it. I'd like to share my disappointment in the Labor Party. Here, here, Tim, I completely agree. In conclusion, 
This bill that we are debating tonight, this Senate voting reform, is well overdue. They are reforms that will improve our democracy. They will make it fairer. They will put power back in the hands of the voters. And that, Mr Acting Deputy President, is a very good thing.